Hello once again, it's Pastor John Carlo, Senior Pastor of the Christian Pentecostal Church in Staten Island. And we've been studying the doctrine of salvation, this powerful gift that God has given us, that we can be saved. And remember, we were talking and looking at 15 different words that try to explain the, this doctrine of salvation. And as we continue in our study, one of the words that comes up is adoption. Kind of an interesting word. How, how does it deal with salvation? But we see very carefully that the word of adoption is a word that means someone taking a son or daughter into their family, right? Now, if we look at the scripture in Galatians 4 and 4, we read this, but when the fullness of time was come, in other words, when God was ready, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons and daughters jesus came to allow us to be adopted by god himself let's take a look at some of the interesting aspects of the of what adoption is most of us are familiar with adoption when it comes to uh, normal, early, worldly kind of fleshly kind of things that happen to people. But we see that spiritual adoption here is a lot different from the civil adoption. Now, the one thing about adoption is we never adopt our own children. They're already ours, right? But look at this. God only adopts any other child. In a civil adoption, we see there's comfort for the childless, but God has a son, as we read Jesus Christ, prior to even adopting us. And then we also see this, an adoption which is done through the courts of civil adoption could never give the child the nature of the father, a different line of blood, bloodline and so on. But God's adoption are given the very mind of Christ. Now again, in some cases, civil adoption could be declared null and void. Someone adopts someone and something happens in the family and it can be, it can be taken away. But God's adoption are absolutely secure when he adopts us into, into the family of God. Now let's take a look at how spiritual adoption compares with civil adoption. Now notice in civil adoption, adoption, the father must bring the action leading to the adoption or the mother. In other words, there has to be, this is Old Testament now, there has to be a, a man, a family man, a father, who is requesting this adoption situation. Now, both adoptions will give a new name to the child. And we know that the new name in Christ is a totally different one than our name here on earth. Now take a look at some scripture because it's kind of like a trinity. Number one, there is an intimacy toward the father when it comes to being adopted by God. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father, in Romans 8 and 15. That word Abba is the term daddy. It's a close relationship. It's not just a son or daughter. It's a close familial relationship. Very personal. And we also see that there's illumination in God's adoption by the Holy Spirit because he leads us and assures us that we are adopted into the family of God. And interestingly enough, there's an inheritance that we are going to receive by being adopted into Christ. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews 2 and 11, we are joint heirs with Christ. Wow. Now, a second word that is used in a group of words uh, trying to explain the doctrine of salvation is supplication. Big word supplication. 
Supplication is actually defined as a humble prayer. Now, what does this have to do with adoption? Listen to 1 Timothy 2.1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men and women. We see that praying is always part of our adoption process and our salvation process. It begins with a prayer, whether it's said out loud or said in the mind. There is a beginning mark marked by prayer. We have to come to the knowledge that we are not living what we should, where we should, not living the life that will get us to heaven. Maybe we're addicted to things that are wrong and so on. So the prayer of salvation is very important because it opens the door to the process. Now, we read as we continue this definition of prayer that this is a kind of prayer that we can define as having fellowship with God. He is our Father. We've spoken about this before. When we came to Christ, we have certain rights and privileges. We can talk to our Father in heaven anytime, any place, for any reason. Amen. So there's that constant fellowship with God that is available to us. We also see that even Jesus in his prayers, many of them were model prayers, and prayers have kind of interesting types of development. Let's take a look at them. First of all, prayer should always be a personal relationship with God. Our Father, right? It begins with our Father, Jesus' example of a prayer. We're talking to our Heavenly Father, not our earthly Father, but our Heavenly Father, the Creator of all things, right? And we see this beautiful relationship between our Father in Heaven and us. Then we see the next phrase. It says, which art in Heaven. This is relying on our faith that we have a Father, but our Father is in Heaven. Paul declares that without this element, our prayers are useless. We can take a look at Hebrews 11:6. Our Father in the spiritual realm cannot be a man of flesh. He has to be God, who is way beyond that. Then we see the next part of the prayer is, Hallowed be thy name. We see we are giving God not only service, but we are telling him who he is. That he's, he's beyond anything. We praise and worship God because of who he is. Hallowed be thy name. Thy name is powerful and so on. Then we go on and we see thy kingdom come. Which is interesting. It tells us that God has, has a kingdom coming down the line of history Amen. that we're going to be part of Amen. in heaven. It's a, it's a multi minilateral mini kingdom that God speaks about, especially in the book of Revelation. And we're praying that he's going to come back. When Jesus comes back, we're going to go and reign with him in heaven forever. Then is the term submission. We read it this way, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus would also say this even at the cross when he acknowledges his father. And then there's a petition in this prayer. This is a request. Give us this day our daily bread. Listen carefully. Our praying for bread is really saying that God has something to do with everything about us. The food that we eat and so on, our daily bread. And then there's a confession part to the prayer. And forgive us our debts. Forgive those we have done, our sins. We've come into God's presence and we're getting to the real point of our prayer, that we want to be forgiven. And this is one of the, the, the perks, the 
wonderful privileges that we have as sons and daughters of God in salvation. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We even sin at times. But God is willing to forgive us, his adopted children. And that's the beauty of this whole relationship. Then there's something that people wish were not in the, in the scripture. Here's God forgiving us, and it says, as we forgive our debtors. Wow, 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 wow. If you expect God to forgive you, we have to forgive people who have hurt us. It doesn't mean they're off the hook with God. They have to individually do that. But we're off the hook. We're not walking around angry. We're not looking for revenge and so on. We're allowing God to take care of everything. Then we see here part of the prayer that we read talks about dependence on God. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. In our prayers, we know that we can't do it without God. That we have to be constantly aware of where we are, what we are, and who we are. We're, we're sons and daughters of the living God. And as believers, we know what is right and what is wrong. Not according to us or the world, but according to God. And again, we're asking God to deliver us, to give us the strength to say no when we need to say no, and so on. And then it goes on to tell us this. Lead us out into temptation and deliver us from all evil. For thine, him, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. There's no greater person than God. Everything is his and everything that comes to us in salvation is because of his love for us. What are the reasons for prayer? Think about it. Well, why should we pray? Well, the first thing about it is God commands us to do it. He doesn't ask, he commands us to keep in touch with him. He wants to hear from us. How many times? Well, that's up to us. Don't be a person who just waits for something to go wrong to pray. Our prayer should be when something is going wrong or about to go wrong. It also should be when we're happy. And we just want to acknowledge God and what he's doing for us and what he's done for us, right? We also see the early church was told to pray, to keep in contact with God, praying individually and praying as a group. And that keeps us in this beautiful relationship, this close relationship. Now, what does prayer do for us, this Supplication. Well, take a look at some scripture. Luke 22, 32. Our prayers can defeat the devil. Wow. The devil's trying to do something to us or a loved one or friend or whatever. Our prayers can stop him dead, right? Our prayers can bring a sinner to Christ as we pray that God would give them favor in Luke 18 and 13. Our prayers can bring back the backslider, the person who knew God, knew all about God, maybe even made a profession of faith for salvation, and they have gone back to whatever they came out of, or worse, in James 5.16. We can pray for sons, our earthly sons and daughters that maybe are not doing what we should, they should be doing, and having God somehow draw them back. Maybe not through us, maybe through other people, maybe through a program on television or the radio, that God will continue to draw them back and forgive them as well. Our prayers send forth laborers. Matthew 9, 38. People that will continue the work of God. If we didn't continue the work of God, it would have stopped right after Christ died. A few years after that, people would have forgotten everything. But God made a way that we pass it on to others. New, new souls coming into the kingdom and so on. How about this one? Our prayers to Christ can heal the sick. Wow. This is probably the most common prayer we hear in church. That someone is sick or someone's in trouble. But remember, our prayers shouldn't only be what I call the 911 prayers. You know, something going wrong, we pull it, we pull the cord. 
right, for help. How about just praying and glorifying God, praising God, spending time in his presence? Revelation 5.8 gives us a good example of that. And then there's something that we may come up with in our life, and we won't understand why, but look, our prayers can accomplish the impossible. Did you hear what I said? Our prayers can accomplish the impossible. That is, we pray to God, and Jesus had told us, we've talked about this, to continue praying, continue knocking on the door of heaven. And it could be for something impossible, in the sense that there's no plan that we could imagine that would change the situation or do something and so on, even in healing. We've seen people that literally, literally came back from the dead. And people who were destined to die, all of a sudden they're healthy and back walking and talking among us, right? And then prayers can also bring good things to us. Psalms 102, 17. And even be able to give good things to other people that are hurting. We have a food pantry. We're doing between five and 7,000 people every month. Again, it's not because we're making money. It's not because we're just giving out food. We're trying to help them. And hopefully through helping them, they would come to know the Lord Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We offer them material and hopefully they'll read it and also come to find the Savior. We also see prayer because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us can give us wisdom. Wisdom is better than knowledge. Knowledge is this information. Wisdom tells us how to use it. Yes. And we see this wisdom can help us in so many ways, not just spiritually, but even on our jobs, and even in situations. There are times when God has told me to be quiet. When you wanted to have an argument, or would have been an argument, right? And that comes up to the next thing, bestowing peace. Do we want to walk around in a battle all the time? No good for your body, no good for your, your, your soul. We want to have peace. Peace in our homes, peace in our hearts, peace in our church, and so on. The world's looking for peace. But instead they get pieces as they blow each other up. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4, 5 through 7. And then finally, keeping us from sin. We don't have to wait to sin to ask for forgiveness. We can ask God to keep us from sinful situations. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you realize you shouldn't be there. You get that feeling through the Holy Spirit to get out of there. Yeah. Right? And finally, revealing the will of God. And this is important. Luke 11, 9, we come to Christ, we get saved, and we wonder, what's the plan that God has for us? And I've noticed this with God. He doesn't give us the whole story. I, I think the reason why is if we knew the whole story, we'd run away. But he opens the door to good things for us, to see things in our life and in the lives of others that are going to be changing, hopefully. The will of God is so important to find. Because when it's our will or somebody else's will, it doesn't always work out. But God knows what's best for us and what will work for us and in us. And I think we'll stop here today. Just think about some of the things that we said. The supplication is a very important part of the doctrine of salvation. We don't just get saved and then walk away and go back to our old ways. There's going to be changes in our life, changes that are good for us spiritually and even physically. So again, this doctrine of salvation was paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ. It is so precious, money cannot buy it. We can't even sell it. But we can tell people about it. And certainly, they will hear the word and hopefully they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be saved. God bless you. We'll see you next week.